Hey, 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 welcome to Hashtag Renap Guzichwanuka. This is the number one African millennial podcast that sits at the intersection of mental health, self discovery, and personal growth. Before we get into the details of today's episode, I have three points to pass. Whoever tuned into last week's episode, that is number one. Whoever tuned into last week's episode and has come back for this one, thank you so much, so, so, so much for contributing to the growth of this podcast. My hope is that you have already clicked the subscribe button so that you don't miss any other episode. We have even made the podcast easier to access. Just search for it on YouTube and click that subscribe button. Number two, I would like to send a quick shout out to these two people who have so far donated to the podcast this year and that is Dennis and Dave. I'm only using their first names because by the time I hit the record button I had not sought their consent to say their full names. So thank you Dennis and Dave. So if you're anything like Dennis and Dave, if this podcast has impacted you in some way, the later day here stands for donation and if you wish to extend one to the podcast you can deposit it on plus two five six seven seven zero three three eight four four zero the number is registered in the names of Nava network thank you so much in advance number three the other way that you can support the podcast and get something in return is by purchasing any of the thrivis products thrivis is the first mental health product line with affordable products that you can use whenever you need something to lean on for emotional or mental support currently we have coloring books of all ages and affirmation mugs check out thrivis on facebook and instagram For this particular episode, I took a seat with the phenomenal, brilliant Christian apologist and humanitarian Rachel Motesi. This conversation has a couple of uncomfortable themes that keep circling back to the fact that the opposite of poverty is justice. This is something, this is a phrase that she came with on the podcast, but for most of the experiences that she had, most of the things that she was sharing, this particular phrase kept re-echoing in my mind. So without further ado, I know I have delayed you. <laughs> Let us get into the conversation. Hi Rachel. Hello. It's an honor to it's have an you. Honor. Let me tell you, I don't know if you know this, but maybe I informed you about it. In 20, I don't know when. I don't remember the year. Maybe 20 I don't remember the year. But we met at the mental health run. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember what story you told, but maybe it was about getting kids off the street. I don't really remember, but I saved your number. <laughs> and then one time I landed on you on Facebook. So I followed you. I asked for a friend request so that it keeps reminding me that I need to have a conversation with you so that it's not just a phone number. So by the time you, <laughs> you like text me, I couldn't even confess that, hey, I already have your number. Okay, interesting. <laughs> That's interesting because usually I'm the ones talking and asking numbers. And- <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Wow. No, I, I think when you're reading the number, I, maybe I didn't have a clear recollection whether I had mm-hmm. the number or not because time had gone by. And so when I was writing it, the name popped. I was like, yikes. <laughs> The number interesting <laughs> interesting i feel special already oh come on i feel special yeah <laughs> <laughs> if a cool person has your number maybe uh, i'm a little cool <laughs> you're cooler, <laughs> you're cooler. <laughs> we're not going to the debate are we <laughs> so let us have this conversation let us hear from who we have on set who is rachel for the person that may not have heard about motessi rachel let us hear from you. Who are you? Yeah, um, Mutesi Rachel. Hi, everyone listening in. Uh, yeah, my name is Rachel Mutesi. Actually, I have another complex one called Kweto Laku. So my surname is Kweto Laku, but I say my trade name is Mutesi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one from both Eastern and Western Uganda. Kweto Laku is like limiting yourself, is it? Kweto Laku. So, so the story goes, I was a very shy kid, very shy, a very crybaby and I used to separate myself. So, 
What? Yeah, yeah. So no one believes that part. <laughs> Wait, so I would I would have taken it as a nickname. It was, but actually there is another question. Who like registered it? So um, yeah, my family, my mom did. <laughs> so I have Rachel Mutesi Kweto Laku. Uh, so that's my name. So anyone who says Kweto Laku, then I know they know me from long ago. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Rachel is, um, I think by practice, I'm a social worker. So I spend most of my time listening to people and understanding what they're going through and then try to act accordingly. So I found myself in schools talking about, and villages talking about menstruation. In fact, mm-hmm. there was a time when I was nicknamed Mama Pad. Whoa, <laughs> how long back is that? <laughs> That's I think 2020, 2020 to 2022 because we're doing a PADS initiative with the communities after COVID. Mm-hmm. And uh, lottery, contact. unfortunately the person who named me this name is late now. He was in an oh. accident. Uh, but he was like, and we went to villages in Kira, Kalere and neighboring communities, uh, just teaching women in small groups, definitely obeying the SOPs yeah. Yeah, at that time. And, um, and so, but I've done that since forever. Uh, even as a teenager, I remember going into schools, supporting my mom, who's a teacher to, to do menstrual health hygiene training. And then I'm a Christian and a preacher at that. Yeah. Uh, I tell a story that I became a Christian when I was offered a bowl of rice. And uh, because we, I was growing up in a home where rice and beef was on special days. And so when these Christians would give me rice, I'm like, if Jesus, what about warm chair? I'm good to go. <laughs> I'm following him. I'm not looking back. <laughs> and so I'm a passionate preacher. In fact, I'm trained in Christian apologetics. And that doesn't mean that I go around apologizing. I go around giving a defense for why people believe (laughs) that Christianity is true or all the truth claims of Christianity. Um, Yeah, I am a poet, though I say that silently because I write and I never try to speak them out. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'll never find me performing, but I write a lot. And now on Um, that note... Uh, Because there is that one that really struck. You might have shared it towards the end of last year. And shay. Hey. Yeah. Out there. I don't remember the title, my friend. Yeah. yeah. I just remember what I felt. Because I kept replaying. I was like, these are deep emotions in here. And that's when I was like, do you mind me resharing this? Because in a way it was sharing awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think when I write out there was, um, we had a situation with a girl. So I ran a, ch- a charity called Ufa Hari Girls and our vision is to create... Ooh, ooh, let, let us go back to it. Ura? Ufa Hari. Ufa Hari Girls. Ufa Hari Girls, yes. Okay. And uh, our vision is to create a safe environment for girls free from sex abuse and sex exploitation. And then we go on to provide them an opportunity to get education. And so um, the way it plays out is different. So people call us when girls are suffering from sex abuse or exploitation. Unfortunately, almost the girls that come in my care have already been victims of sex violence in a way. Um, But last year we had had received a call about this girl who had gone into labor and so I was having lunch, having a good day. And someone was like, Rachel, there is a girl here. I said, Tech at hospital, come after lunch. And I just had no idea what I was getting myself into. In fact, today is a year and a day since that girl came into my care. And so we sent her to Naguru. I said, take her to Naguru, we'll follow it from there. By evening, we had learned that she had an obstructed pregnancy. But she had been homeless. And she was the dirtiest person you could have met. Um, Nor any, what do they call, grooming whatsoever was going on with her. And she had not bathed for a little while. So the evening I went back to her house where this person had met her. This is a known friend. I'd not seen her maybe in 10 years. Whoa. And she was just called, she had just returned from Kenya. And this girl in Kansang is in her neighborhood. So she walks in there. I think she she thought she looked friendly. She's a very friendly person. Yes, that's why she walked to her house. So anyway, my friend calls and I go back to see, is there anything she has before we buy anything? And w- so we walk into this house, which was basically an abandoned old building. And she had a five liter jerry can and a very old cup and a mattress, which I think she stole from the neighborhood, very torn, very dirty, uh, where she was sleeping, not close, no whatsoever. 
And so that, so when we go back to hospital, I'm sure we don't have anything. And so we have to go to one. And usually I run to Facebook. I say, oh, we have this person. Right. Please help me. And uh, by evening, she was going into surgery. And one thing led to another. She, we went, she later on went into her four major surgeries, and which led us to be in ICU. And, uh, and then lastly, we went into the uh, specialized women hospital. Mulago. Uh, Mulago. And w- there the doctor said to me, actually, I think you had brought in a dead body. Because as soon as we walked in 30 minutes, she went into surgery that went for 10 and a half hours. And I'd gone for days without sleeping because I was just traumatized with the whole experience. We had first been in public facilities where I had also met other children that had suffered almost similar situations. And I think my brain could not hold it. So I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I'm just tired. I'd spent five days without sleeping. On the sixth day, I challenged myself that I'll take my team, everyone who was helping me to take care of this girl. We paid someone in the hospital and said we were going to be away for a day. We had fish, we went to the beach, we were at Lido and had everything. (laughs) And nothing happened. So I come back and I'm thinking, when I go, remember I've spent five days without sleeping. So I'm like, when I get to my bed, surely after being in the water, I don't swim, but I was in Lugano, Kubiata, I was kubiata <laughs> And I'm thinking, I will sleep. And I couldn't sleep. And I thought something is wrong. And that night I wrote two poems. One started with, if you come to my funeral, know that my thoughts killed me. Mm. Because I could not. We had talked to the mother who had said to me, Ogwamusota, that's a snack. You can only bring her wabangalimo books. In other words, you can bring back that girl if you, she's dead. And so I was trying to contemplate, what does that even mean? How do I w- finally walk away from this girl who has, I've now cared for maybe this is like the 26 from her life, whom I have become her only source of help, hope. And also now merging that with other, other stories that I was encountering within the hospital. And I won't go in what looks like in a public you know, hospital in Uganda. I won't go into those details. And now I was not sleeping. And so I'm thinking, my mind is racing. I had just suffered from an accident. So I had crutches on. Everything was going on <laughs> as I'm looping around, right? And I had fallen off a bicycle because I was trying to run to get medicine on time. And, you know, so it was a very hectic time. And, and as I come in the night and I'm like, God, if you can help me, please help me. And then later on, I, because I was very tired still, that poem didn't do the magic. Then I write something and say, I'll dare. You know, sometimes my life is tiring and the prospect of dying seems more soothing than living. But I'll dare to live. Pause. Right there. I just even got the goosebumps again. <laughs> like, if someone has experienced any suicidal ideations, that specific poem really communicates deeply. And for me, I think when I listened to it, when I saw you sharing it, I can't tell how many times I played it, but I might have realized that, or maybe it placed me in a moment of gratefulness that, Mm -hmm. thank God I survived. But then it just, it just made so much sense. And it also made me feel for anyone that might be struggling Mm. in that moment. Mm. You have taken us on a very high speed, Rachel. (laughs) <laughs> I wanted I wanted to ask you let us go step by step process by process okay. I wanted to ask you how you're doing but you've not even given me a chance Rachel allow I me am to tired. ask you <laughs> <laughs> the table the table between us is is, is, is really wide should have extended some strength <laughs> Yeah, I think I think if I am, the honest feeling is that of fatigue and mm. uh, partly because um, I think it's an ongoing struggle. Um, like what I've said, we have children. My husband and I have taken on 11 children now um, whom we are caring for. And like I said, these are broken children. So the story lives in your head sometimes. And so you multiply that with everyday work. That's a lot. And, and I think that's what is happening right now. Uh, but I'm grateful to be here. I think that um, conversations on mental health um, must happen. Mm-hmm. And so I celebrate any person who would say, let's have a conversation. And I think you have done that very well. And Thank so you. I feel very honored to be in the same space with you. I'm more honored. I don't know if you understand. <laughs> 
I don't think you understand where I'm coming from, but I was, I don't know, for lack of a better word, I was starstruck on you when I heard you speak. Mm. I cannot tell you what you might have said, but I just know in my head, I was like, I need this woman. Oh, thank you. I don't know why I said a lot of sensible things. <laughs> oh, get out. <laughs> oh, dear. So take us through this journey. You have talked about yourself as someone who is doing work in regards to menstrual hygiene awareness or menstrual health awareness. What informs your motivation? Um, I think so. Growing up in the slum, you know, I... I grew up in poverty. In fact, when I was coming, someone has said that the opposite of um, justice is poverty. The opposite? And and I always feel like if you grow up in a poor community or a poor family where you lack many things, then everything seems to be at a disadvantage. You know, the girl I've just talked about, if we were richer our situation would have been differently. We would have hired maybe a nurse or someone to take over, but we we had to take on most of the activity because we could not pay for that. So I I was born in Ginger uh, in the 1990, and then my parents separated in January 1991. And I think wow. um, because, because of Shem, my mom moved to Kalere. She had her cousin who was working in Kalere, And she had been one of the founding members of the local school. It's called Community Primary School. It was established by the church um, to offer education for all the kids in the community. If you think Kalera Islam is poor, take it 30 years ago. It was really, really poor. And many kids were out of school. They were selling buvela in the market. And um, opendification and every other thing (laughs) was going on in that slum. And so the church through World Vision had offered education. So my mom is invited by her cousin to come and teach in this school. And we, I think her salary at that time was 20K, 20,000 shillings, Ugandan shilling. It was heavier in value mm-hmm. as opposed to now. And um, and she could not pay rent on that money. So she decided that we'll stay in a school store. And I remember we shared that there was another teacher called Winnie, who sadly her son died at seven. But we shared that space, Aunt Winnie and my family. So myself and my young, my older sister, and then my mom, uh, and teacher Winnie with her son. And I mean, broken chairs, everything that the school didn't want, they would bring it to our house. Uh, we had rats that if you slept, you would wake up in the morning as a kugugunye. I don't know <laughs> the English word, but they would try to eat your your foot. And um, and then. So my mom says this is not true because apparently Kalere has always had a lot of food. But when you're young, somehow I think your memory just picks in some jumbled ideas. But I remember that we would have, because for her she says, I always say, Twali anga lmonde ne muogo. That she says, Twali anga nama toke, kubanga matoke gechu kumigali gamala. Right? Um, but I remember that even when we had the food, sometimes the sauce would be water anga batade momo nyo. Or it would be in Tula or things like that. So I grew up seeing poverty. And then when it rained, which in the rainy season it always did, uh, there were not as many houses in Kalere, we would spend the night standing. But remember, this is a place that almost had no latrines. Yeah. Later on in the later 90s, KCCA and World Vision and some organized AMREF came in to establish uh, public latrines. But so the water that is coming in your house is unbelievable. And so I knew death at a young age because quickly someone has typhoid, quickly someone has diarrhea. Um, and so I saw those. But but I think the more I grew up, and especially when I became a Christian, um, I'm a Christian at nine, and then at 12, you start understanding the world a little bit. Then I started seeing how kids were you know, wasting away, for lack of a better word. I could see some of my friends were in P6, now start having sex with anybody, you know, border guy or I call a chapati. In fact, I remember in when I was in P6, there was a girl who was slightly older than us and the boys then could form gangs and they would collect money and bet on a girl who is beautiful. Now, thankfully, no one thought I was beautiful, <laughs> but they would bet on a beautiful girl. 
and then they would try to befriend her. Neba mkwana. I don't know what's the best word English word for kwana. Um, <laughs> we usually misuse con. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they con. You know, they <laughs> <laughs> so they ask her out, right? And then what they would do, they would lure this girl into one of those small rooms, and any boy who contributed the money would sleep with that girl. And so I remember this story of this girl who was beautiful by all the definitions of the slum. I mean, light-skinned, larger hips. and But she was young. She was in P6. And I remember, so these boys used her. And I don't think there was any, either the police didn't, had not learned about it. Or, but I don't remember if there was any intervention. But what I know that, because my mom was a teacher, they came and told her the story. And I remember even from a young age that people were like, Abalenzi, where about you? Abalenzi, where about you? Where about you? And so those boys got away. And so from a young age, I knew that I had to do the right decisions, not fall victim. Now, my young mind thought that we, the girls, have to do something. Now I know better, yeah. right? But that's, so, so that's why so I have those mental images growing up. And I won't go through my story, how I came through education and stuff, but I remember years later, I got an opportunity to go to the UK and, you know, at around 22, 23. And now I'm telling these stories, and I tell these stories and all you see is surprise, like shock in people's faces. I'm like, what are you saying? These are normal things where I come from. These are normal things. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and, so, and then I'd gone to study to become an evangelist, a Christian apologist, like I said. And then I already say I went as an evangelist and I returned as a humanitarian. Because then I started saying to myself, how do we not see the things? How do I bring together young people? And all I'm telling them is spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and overnight and ignore the fact that someone abused them. Mm. And so that was the changing point that now I start to think of what can we do better? Um, yeah. When you, were totally, when you were telling your story, your experience in Kalera Islam, mm-hmm. I was the time when Queen of Katwe mm-hmm. was released. I was in the cinema. Screen to the studio. I'm just mm-hmm. so addicted to studio. <laughs> when I was in the cinema, I felt embarrassed and guilty for watching that. Because mm-hmm. I was like, is this real or fiction? And I don't remember who I spoke to. And they're like, that's really what happened. And they didn't put out everything. And I was like, what? Because that's what I think as well. So I have been to where they did the filming. I've rescued four girls from there. And the things I've seen when I went to pick those kids is worse than what Queen of Katra can show. And, and also that's the disturbing thing. So, so I'll tell you a quick one. So I bring a friend to my house and at that time we're teaching girls to crochet. And this is COVID, so it's happening in my house, about 10 girls. And for some reason, they are moved to start sharing what they would say if it was their wedding day. And I kid you not, almost everyone in that room was sharing either on how they escaped rap or how they were rapped. And my friend was so confused because everyone was doing it in the most humorous way. <laughs> so, yeah. so Charlie Chibo was in Gachinuma. But you, you like, you sit back and you're like, how did they survive this? And yet they did. So I think for me also being drawn out and then looking at it from a different angle, looking at it outside the place. So I'm like, actually, the story goes that I, at some point I was afraid of coming back, you know, because I, I started thinking, when's I going to Kufa? How long were you there? Uh, I was in England two years. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I was thinking about it like, hey, no. Yeah. So wait, you went straight from your home? Yeah, the first time I went to England, it was from Kalere. The story goes, my church community was amazing. They escorted me. So uh, I had like a bus, a mini bus and a taxi and like two salon cars. So it was special. And we had a prayer meeting there. Yeah. But it was like unheard of. Um, I mean, like today, Kalere is different. You will have fairly wealthier people in there. Mm. Uh, but for us who were there initially, like I said, I remember my brother asked again and I was a mama and I'm are we allergic to chicken? So that, that, that was the background from which we were coming from. And so like life hits you hard. There is no cushion whatsoever. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, so I left. And I won't tell you my airport experience because I left. <laughs> How 
Hey. <laughs> you know, you've met me. Shut <laughs> up. Like, because I think when you're also talking about, oh my God, let me check it. That's Swahili word, Ufahari. Ufahari. I was preparing myself to ask you what could have informed you mm-hmm. to get to the point of shielding girls from sexual violence. And I, I did not think it was something that would have been coming from yourself as a child. After hearing this story of the girl in her P6, mm-hmm. as, what could have happened? Because you've mentioned the part where you say that now it's the girl's to do something to stop this kind of narrative. How did you move forward? Were you on your tippy toes? Were you scared? I think yes and no. Um, I feel like one, I was one of the ugly kids. So is that, is that because someone told you that? Yes. Yeah, so many people would say that I was extremely tiny. I've gained over 10 kilograms. You've gained? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm struggling with weight. <laughs> In the past two years, I've gained about 10 kilograms. So it was, no, take me back at 12. You have like a walking stick. Um, so, and anything you know, because slums are like, you're in the town, but you think like villagers, right? And in the village, an average person thinks like, if you, you are big, then you have money, you're healthy. When you're small, like I was, then you're very unhealthy. Um, and you could have told I don't have straight teeth like most people. So so mm-hmm. people pick on some of those things. Um, and so I had it from everybody that I, I wasn't attractive. Um, but then there were also places we knew where you don't go. Uh, in fact, there is a gentleman who died late last year. And before he reformed, he was known for raping women. You know, in fact, I was talking to in a friend Calera? of mine. Yeah. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is a Muslim, and he said, I know that guy has ref- had reformed in the past 10 years. He was a different man. But it's like, I could not get myself to forgive him or to forget, right? And like, I think he died with about 149 children or something, some crazy number. But it was known. And I remember my sister, for example, my sister is gorgeous, you know, uh, lighter and she has all the calves and stuff. And for her, every time she would walk in past eight, this guy would be uh, chasing after her. And I remember one time she came in past nine and she chased her and she ran into a pit latrine. And she was there for like three hours because that guy was outside. Now, again, think Katwe, think Kaleri. <laughs> that's, that's sad being a pit latrine because usually the hygiene is not good, but she had to stand there for that time because she knew if I got out and this guy was known for walking to anybody, even if you're walking in the market and he needed you, he would, but he, he was a little wealthier compared to other people. And so he would corrupt his way um, to get out of the police custody and stuff. And so I think there was always a sense in which, like, you have to be careful. The places you can go. Wasanga guy, um, he was actually, he had locks. So Wasanga Rasto, no Kuduka, things like that. Um, and then we knew the bad boys as well. And for me, again, like I've said, I was being raised by a teacher who I think my mom is a matriarch. She, she, has, she had a presence, she had a special presence. She's very tender. And kind, so she would help parents who could not pay the tuition. And so there was a special admiration towards my mom. And that, you know, spread down to us. Like, people would want to protect us. But you might not teacher. In fact, um, in, in around maybe 2019, I, I got a man arrested. And, um, and I think his fellow gang members came back. They wanted to get me. And they suckled me in this very isolated spot in Kalere. And I thought it was it all. And they had knives. And until one walked to me and I go, oh, no, I want teacher. Oh, no, I want Jessica. And they let me go, right? One and of them. Yeah, one of them said, So my mom had that kind of like presence to her. Uh, and that protected us in a little way. But also for me, I knew, especially being a Christian, that you had to protect yourself. You know, you had to abstain. You had to be good. You had to dress up very long. I had that very conservative uh, mindset of what Christianity would look like. You you have to cover. So I never had a boyfriend until I was 20. And even at 20, I don't know if we were dating, but 
<laughs> you were hanging out. <laughs> I was heartbroken and when he walked away but Aww. I think his convince went on dating but <laughs> <laughs> So so yeah so so there was always that fear that was planted especially to the good looking kids but also there was a pressure to protect yourself and then again there were others who that was the norm and the given so there is a zone in Kalira Bajita Chigei where at least an average girl it's a nickname of Chigei. a zone Chigei like from gossip and an average girl would be pregnant at 15 and that's like the norm and you know so there's small girls who have given birth to small girls who you find grandparents are 32 or 35 but because that has been the norm and many of these because I've been there know that it was an effect of abuse um but we find ways of sugarcoating it mm-hmm. yeah you've mentioned that part where your mother might be the person who introduced you to church and now you're talking about the conservativeness in mm-hmm. the Christian world and what you're experiencing. And then you also mentioned, it must have been in the beginning of the conversation where you're like, if Jesus comes <laughs> with a bowl of rice, mm-hmm. I'm definitely following him. At what age did you feel like Christianity is it? I think earlier on, at nine, I was a Christian and um, mm-hmm. when I became a Christian, it was it was a radical transformation because this is how I know. Because when I went back to school, I stood up to be the religious prefect, and I was in charge of religion until I finished senior six. From what? Wait, from, from P four, like P four, nineteen ninety nine. Yes, you're always looking at that position. Yes, so I was always. It kept on just changing the name. Mum uh, in secondary it becomes Mama Evangelist or um, or. It's either evangelist or it was chairperson, scripture union, or religious prefect. Or uh, so sometimes actually people are disappointed when they find me walking and I'm putting on trousers. And then sometimes, like, yeah, <laughs> right now, <laughs> yeah, because they know me from those days of being very conservative about faith. And so they're like, eh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or when I say something, they feel like, oh, that's unchristian enough. And now I'm married with a guy, to a guy who has locks, so to some, I really, really backslid. <laughs> Uh, but but yeah, so I, I feel like there was an anchoring. And, and when I joined Senior One, I joined um, Scripture Union. And then Faith there even took a different shape. And I remember my mom says she had issues with my sister in terms of discipline at school. But for me, the only concern she ever had about me at school was how much I read the Bible. And so she was like, oh, she's working hard. She's doing this, but she reads the Bible. Um, and so where they expect me to read a textbook, I would be reading. And I'd memorize a lot of scripture. But I think even in my young mind, I knew that this is the only way you can be saved because everything around you. Now I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the sex abuse that was going on. I've not talked about the drugs. I've not talked about, um, I don't know if this was common in other slums, but people use mob, 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 um, mob justice. You see, you see that part where you're talking about the mob justice? Mm. I actually wanted to ask you about that Rasta. I also don't want to call him Rasta because mm-hmm. he mm-hmm. taints the other Rastas. Mm. Why is it that it was hard for the community to come together against him? Because I'm, I'm imagining the number would be bigger against him. I think there is a sense in which society, and I'm going to generalize here, but allow me, where if it has happened to a woman, then she's to blame. And I feel like that perception still carries on. Let's go back. So so Rasta wasn't responsible for that girl. It was a different set of boys, right? Mm-hmm. But still for me, I remember the conversation was like, I can't now come alive. But we are talking of a 12 or 13 year old. And so I think there has always been a generalized sense of, um, because like I said, thieves were punished. Exactly. Thieves were banned. Exactly. Um, and, but that didn't happen for her. And I think because somehow we excuse those issues when it comes to women. So for me, one, the other term I use is like invisible, invisible children. And I've seen that carry on. I, I got myself in very wrong books at a particular church when... <laughs> when um, one of the girls was undressed in a church school because Yaliya Dugala, right? And I said, this is on, you, you even question him because I question, I question, I challenge the leadership, even the pastor. And they're like, and then I said, this conversation is only happening because of the one 
let's assume it was Sanga Liambogo. This would be a different thing. Everyone would be arrested right now. We wouldn't be having. So I think there is a sense in which society tries to blind itself about some social ills. And so we find excuses on why something had happened. And what do we do? We name the victim. We say, and so, so I think that that's something I'm learning, but thank you for asking. I've never asked that. How could we? But then also one thing I know is that this guy is wealthy. He owned a lot of the land in the community. And yet he was chasing down young yes. girls. Yes, and then also the other thing is that he ran a big gang. So Yali Azimba, H4, and I think anyone from Kalera would know this. So he had established like a, a little settlement and there were other gang members. So if you touched him, how about the other, maybe who were like a hundred on in their nineties. So it, it was really hard. You come after one, you come after them all. And so the, there was like just a generalized terror about the whole thing because actually um, Saji Islam, when he was talking to me, he said that guy had said that in a woman who is outside between five, between nine p.m. to five a.m. Abam Chalawe. So it was to blame. You were to blame. Why are you out at ten p.m.? Why are you out at this? But yet some abuses happen during the day. But he had influence. But I think because society sometimes is blinded. Um, and so there was some of those inconsistencies that were happening. And I think even today I see that. Like I've said, it's people look at one. I'll give you another example. Um, when I returned from the UK in 2015, we had a meeting. And it was open to everybody. Again, thinking menstrual hygiene. Normally menstrual hygiene is like a startup conversation to get to know where the girls are at. So we take sunnies, disposable ones, but in the future then we teach them how to make washable ones. But they always give us an entry point into any place we want to be. And uh, so this girl had come into the meeting and I had a friend who is a pastor's wife and mm -hmm. everything was so cool. And then she puts up her hand and then she says, oh, um, this is a girl in P6, so 11, 12-ish. And, and she says, um, I have a question. And then she says, which scriptures can I read to be strengthened? Okay, I'm thinking, okay, no 11-year-old asks this question. That's the question I ask. <laughs> You know, with everything that has happened in my life. Because what, what kind of strength are you looking for at that age? I know. I know. So she, so she asked that. And then she said, what do you do if you hate your father? And then she brought the $1 million question, like, how do I kill him? <laughs> and um, and I, I always joke and say, I think she thought we're a terror group. But <laughs> but, 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 but she goes on to to explain that her father worked up country. And every time he returned, he by naka yumba kamaka zigo, you know, musical. You just have one room that's separated by a curtain. Uh, a curtain. And her stepmom was there, and she would say, like a ten, when Agatali Komfu is playing, the father would now try to sleep with her. And she said, I scream. In in the presence of the stepmother? Behind the curtain. So the mother is Mutsenge. She's been tasked to remain Munda. Mudiro, right? And so the assumption is the stepmother has no idea what's going on. Is that possible? It's not. It and then, so she said to me, it's just, like, a, it's just one room. Yeah, she says, I kept on putting on extra pants, but it kept on ongoing. And so, of course, I don't know what to do with this story at this point, but I was determined to help. And um, so the next morning I was speaking in one of the affluent churches. And I met this pastor. She said, oh, thank you for coming. She was a female pastor. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, God has opened my heart to go to the slum. And, and I'm like, Tofayo, <laughs> I have a starting point. And I tell the story. And she says to me, Richard, the girl is 11. In the slum, three-year-olds are abused. And that was her way of saying, that's none of my concern. And even if it's true that, yeah, yeah, you're no nika, but she needs our help. And I was able to get her into another pastor's home. And by the second day, she was a slave. I went there and I was like, I'm like, no, of course she would. She's in fear. That, She's in that, fear. That's of the course. only place of she course. has. Of course. And, and then, and then the, the, they were like, and I'm thinking she's even younger than your children. 
So we were able to get her out and put her in a boarding school. And finally, we're able to reunite her with her mom who lives in Sudan. Um, so, so I've lost touch, you know, I've lost contact with them. But so that was like the initial stages of like Ufahari and how, what we were envisioning. Um, but yeah, that left me. So that attitude of someone saying, or things like, and in my mind, I'm like, this is a, this is a scared child. Yeah. They need protection. They so um, so it's been instances like those that um, make you to stop and wonder. But that's a good question. I don't think I've ever stopped to ask why. Yeah, I and when you mention that, it makes me feel like we are really in a dismissive culture mm-hmm. because I was having this back and forth in the comment section with someone. There is a person that that had put up a post about bleaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, someone was, oh my God, I remember the video. So the person was marketing her bleaching business. <laughs> and the tagline at the end was, stop staying in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, that's good marketing. <laughs> it killed me. Because I, I went from being alarmed to, is she kidding? <laughs> <laughs> stop being in the dark. <laughs> so his, his caption was, I think something like, this is sad. Mm. And then someone, a lady came in the comment section trying to go against his caption that mm-hmm. why is it sad? There's so many things going on that are sad, yet you choose to talk about this. And mm-hmm. I'm like, are you kidding? Mm-hmm. So her, her point of argument was there is tattooing. Why aren't we talking about that? Mm-hmm. There is this, there's this. And I want you, when I hear you talking about the church minister who was like three year olds are also <laughs> abused. It it makes me question, so do you mean we should just move on with life like that? Does that mean that this person no longer needs support? Mm-hmm. Where do they go? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the thing is if we are determined that they're not as valuable and hence our name of Ahari then they don't deserve to be. And that's why for me, I said to them, if this happened to a child in Nakasero, would this conversation even be a happening? Of course not. And you see that over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. The stories change, but it's the same mindset that they don't. And back to the first girl I talked about, um, a parent says, oh, 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 you know, it's a curse. And in my mind, I just can't get over it. But what does that communicate to that girl? Right? And we don't look at those, the impact of what that does. And so we stop there. And and I think for anyone listening, that should be a a challenge. When I make such a statement, do I stop and evaluate? Mm -hmm. If that was my daughter, would I be saying the same thing? If it was my sister... But I'd be saying the same things, and usually we don't. We, you know, yeah. you know, what is the story? And and we don't, uh, we don't look past that. What is the story? I just watched Exodus this week. I don't know if you've gotten a chance of looking at his interview. He also mentioned the part of church. He was actually mostly talking about church and how when you fall on hard times someone mostly looks at the church, maybe. Mm-hmm. Mostly looks at what you are doing, but never gets the backstory. Mm-mm. And now here we are again. Yeah, it, it, it has to. We need to find out Rachi, you know, and and I think we don't. Do you feel like we have an allowance of having conversations with people? I think we need to educate the people. We need to show. Because I think also when, when we are telling the story, it's not to tell and say, okay, chino chibi nyo 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 nyo. We need to tell the story and elevate to the point where actually people look at the beauty. And I can, you know, I can talk, tell you about some of our children. And um, some of them, you know, one, three sisters witnessed their mom raped when she had just given birth like days after, you know. And I tried to, at that time, the youngest were three, another was five and another was nine at that time. And so when I went to see them, I said, but jail. You know, <laughs> and but then so when they came, they had traits that I had to struggle with. 
uh, abascal na mtaka once which turned on because to more descal but because they feel like and change ains of tower also you better be ready and yadi avondira mu nyumba most of the time but then i have realized that some of them you know like one of them is such a lovely musician she has a very deep voice but just captivating she's the most sassy human being ever and so seeing that can i see her talent how, the way she makes french can make a friend even out of a fly you know <laughs> like, do we see beyond what has happened but also sometimes we see you know we've talked about ghetto dancers we sometimes we see the happy faces mm-hmm. what are they masking the the times i've had the lowest in my life is when i've been the happiest you know i i will be in my room and i'm thinking okay if i died right now it would be the best thing that can happen to me and then i get out and i am smiling and everyone is praising oh rachel musanyo fabera musanyo yeah and, and- <laughs> Like, well, that's what gets me to go on the next morning because if I stop to tell the story, maybe I will not make it uh, to the next. So I think that the story has to be balanced. What is the good? And to your question, you know, when you say, how are you? I am tired. But right. I'm thankful. That's why, I actually, tension of- <laughs> that's why I gave you the emotional will because I am, what I was doing with it and I feel guilty because that's for some conversations I've, been, I've not been pulling it out is for us to open ourselves to the larger spectrum of emotions because mm-hmm. we find that even as adults we are fine even when we know that we're not but we do not have the courage of mm-hmm. saying it yeah because there's so many things that we are guilt tripped about <laughs> because the moment you say you're not okay someone can easily say well you're not in Mulago mhm yikes yeah yeah so i like the fact that when i ask how you are you're like i'm fatigued i was like yes please i'm hearing Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but you could not be in Mlago but wishing you in Mlago, you know. And not wishing because you're sick, but you're like oba wakiri wakiri ko, you know. I I I've wanted to write about fatigue and 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 I've not had a chance to. And like I said I'm a preacher, so for me I think one of the most compelling invitations that Jesus gives is come to me all who are weary or tired and I'll give you rest. Mhm. Uh because the times i've been so tired and i think this could be the answer i'm like no this is all and right. the times when i've taken medicine to force myself to sleep i'm like i wish i didn't feel that way and i think that sometimes emotional exhaustion is harder than physical exhaustion <sighs> and how many people carry a friend of mine said to me um a very big football enthusiast and every time his game wins he's all over the place and bashing everyone but yeah. also it means that every time he loses everyone is bashing them mm-hmm. and then he so so this time he had lost and he felt so down and he writes to me like at 3 a.m. and he says people don't understand that the only beautiful thing that is happening to my life is football the it's, only yes it's the only thread i'm hanging by and so sasa to them i'm supporting your team So when they troll you send them to me because if anyone can troll I I am gifted. <laughs> you know, but because that I felt like in that moment was was like I'm tired. I go to hospital and they check me nothing is wrong. It's like every day for these past four years I feel sick. I am tired. And so so again maybe their action of going to the hospital is to say you know what? nyenzo oba ayinzo ba wachi balabanga chigenze wrongly and they can but then when they go and actually feel like nothing is wrong then it, it feels like you 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 are seeking for sympathy but actually if you've been to that place like i i told you i was and that's not the first time you know and then you're like truly could be to one because you think your mind is resting and nothing can stop it yet and again if you are believing person like myself there are all these myriads of scripture that are throwing at you I'm not going to sort of be that way. That that you're seen if you're not mm-hmm. happy. Yeah. It's your when you like when you're a Christian and you aren't happy it means you're going against God or something mm-hmm. like that because mm-hmm. you're supposed to be in gratitude mode full time which I find absurd. Yeah. But I'm thankful for the saints in scripture. I mean Job, David, you know Jeremiah oh, right. <laughs> even today I was reading about Esther and Mordecai and they they express D- don't take sentence. me so far don't take me so far <laughs> i don't know the other people <laughs> don't take me so far. people have embarrassed me about the bible here i don't <laughs> okay i stop i know job okay i know job. <laughs> we can stick at job 
yeah, you're taking me at full speed. I it's been a while since I got embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> biblically. <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry, we'll stop at that. Don't yeah. take me so far. I didn't yeah. even know there was a Mordecai in the Bible. I just, wow. <laughs> I just know. Oh That's a I good just, one. <laughs> I just know one Mordecai that I got to find in my head. I was like, what kind of name is that? <laughs> oh my God. It's in the Bible. Don't take me. <laughs> just don't. That's a good one. And now, as a Christian, let us get back to you from the work that you're doing. And now let's have a conversation about Mutesi herself. Mm -hmm. You have had moments. I've seen moments or maybe the day when I met you, when you talked about your experience with anxiety. Where does this start? Do you feel like you have come to a place of acknowledging where it all made up again? I, I, I really don't know. So... I think, you know, like when sometimes we read books and they take you back. So I think I've read a book called When Memory Hurts and uh, it's kind of like easy an inventory to go back to those places and see, um, you know, what happened and what it made you feel or what are the feelings you had then. Um, I think I picked interest in mental health um, maybe 10 years ago. Or it's kind of like grown better. But mm -hmm. I think for these past 10 years, yes, I've kind of like, um, but I think that the point that I can point to is when we again had a child, um, a girl, a young lady had terminated her pregnancy. And um, I think a lot was going on because she didn't want to terminate the pregnancy. So her parents split. And so she she didn't want know how to tell the dad that she had a pregnancy. She was just at campus the first year. And so she thought the father would be disappointed. So she ran to the mom. And then the mom said, oh, how will this mother's union look at me? And so she said, we have to terminate it. Uh, but she wanted to keep the pregnancy. So I, thought, I think she had run to her mom for that support. But anyway, she became very, very suicidal. And she tried killing herself in every possible way, but she did not succeed. So her father, out of depression, takes her to the police station, like just arrest her because he had not slept for many days. Uh, she had tried to throw herself in the lake. She had tried to electrocute herself. She cut her wrist. Nothing was working. Um, and everywhere they went, they were not giving them the support they needed. So like, because remember, she had done all these harms. So she needed real medication and then whatever was going on. Uh, she had had a psychotic breakdown, basically. And I was called in to, to help Stupidly, I agreed. <laughs> so, oh. How, so you, you, are we still looking at 10 years ago? No, we're looking at maybe three years ago. Uh, I, I think 10 years I could see traits, but this is when like, it's like we have to deal with something. And so, so we go into the hospital. We had gone to a particular ministry, which I won't mention. They were very helpful, but they said she has an infection, so take her to hospital. And so we got to the hospital, and at this time, remember she had infections? Mm -hmm. She was also very suicidal. And I kid you not, I stayed with her for three days. And those were the longest days of my life. So I was not sleeping for those three days because she was either taking medicine and trying to sleep. If she was awake, she was trying to kill herself. And because her father was tired and she, he thought I was the one who had the answer, so I had to be there. So I was awake the whole time. That's a lot of pressure. And I wasn't work Like I was... It's some of the things where you even forget to wash your face, right? <laughs> so, so it was like, and, and, and I remember when I left, I came back and a very special friend of mine lost their baby. He had gone for a work trip. They called him and like the baby died. He had a fever and then he died. And then um, something else happened and it put a lot of pressure on me. So I said to myself, you know, after everything, helping my friend, I did the funeral. I, I was a pastor like at the funeral and, and I, you don't know what that does to you because I had this coffin where the baby was just like staring at me and they looked healthy. It was like a glass coffin. And so, and I think my mind was just taking all that in and soaking it in. And so I decided that I would take a break. A lot of other things were going on. I'd been in a meeting where uh, women, someone was doing a research and I happened to be there and he had questioned like seven women to share how they came to Kampala. And I kid you not, everyone had been forced to marry their rapist. I don't know how it was arranged. And it was... The research wasn't about that. But somehow everyone is like, you know, my sister had a friend and he came around and then he pregnant me. I couldn't go back home. That was a common like denominator of these stories. And so I'm taking all this in. 
And so in, in like one week, in a space of one week. And so I decide to myself, you know, I'm going to give myself a treat. I'm going to go away and um, take a break. And so I pack everything, if you know anything. I love company. I'm such a big extrovert. So I decided, but I decided to go alone. I get there, I switch off my phone. And the first day was okay until I got to sleep. And then I wake up, it was very hot, go to the bathroom and then come back. And as I'm laying down, I feel like something is coming and sitting on top of me. You know, if you had that feeling where you feel like some, like a heavy thing is on your body. I think it falls like under hallucination or something. Um, there, I, I, I've heard of it being cold sleep something. Yes. So, so something like that happens. So I'm, I'm lying and then I feel like something is seated on my back. So I'm like, okay, whatever it is. And then, but I'm like subconscious, right? I'm not fully awake. I'm not fully asleep. So I'm lying on my back and so I feel it. And then as I'm sleeping, I feel like something is coming like a cut. And it's kind of like, now I fear cuts with a passion. And it's kind of like leaking my face around my neckline here. And I'm thinking, so in like, like an out-of-body experience, I felt like I moved my hand and caught the tongue. And at this point, this thing falls off my back whatever sensation I was feeling, and I had it fall. <laughs> so I kind of like come out back into my conscience and I start looking for what I'd lost, what, what is done. And, 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 and at this point, I look and there was nothing out. Like everything I had on my bed before I went to sleep, my phone, a torch, everything was there. And I was traumatized. So I get my phone and I'm like, what's going on? Of course, like any good Christian, I go to Psalms 9 to 1. <laughs> those, those who wait upon the Lord. But oh, yeah, thank you. I was going to ask you, what is there? <laughs> oh, those who hide in the shadow of the Most High, he will do this. It's kind of like a prayer protection. I'll protect you from the peaceless of the night. I'll do this and this. It feels so, like all the Psalms are about that. Maybe not. They're poetic. <laughs> They're poetic, yes. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of like raw emotions that you're finding in the sun. But anyway, so I read the scripture and at this point I'm crying. And I think I had not cried from the age I was eight until that time. So I write... You had... Sorry, don't... Manag, to go temple. You had not cried Mm-mm. from the age of eight. Like eight. Yeah. Two... This is like maybe this is twenty twenty one, so to thirty one. Huh? Yeah. That is, oh my goodness! Because I would count that as what twenty twenty one is three years ago. Yeah. So we're looking at thirty one. Yeah. So minus more than 20 eight. Twenty three years. Yeah. No emotional expression of letting your emotions come out of your ear. No, in terms of crying, no. I would shout if I was in pain, but I never cried. So at this time... Was I, it was it a decision that you made her mad? I think so. I was always a crying baby. And um, the story goes that when... So World Vision would give sponsorship to everybody. And... Um, but then there would be specific sponsors who would allow to take on a child. And I think when I was about six, a particular sponsor had wanted to take me on, but I was crying a lot. And so they rejected me because I was crying. So I think as a child, I decided that I don't cry. I'll be rejected. Yeah. And then like, I just became very happy. So partly, I think part of that became with my faith journey, then I became more expressive in terms of joy. But I think I just thought that crying means you're weak, you know. So, but that day, you know, like I think a lot, like I said, a lot had happened during that week and I was very exhausted physically. And yet you uh, couldn't let go. Yeah. And so I think that's why how also the hallucinations had come in. Now, I, I didn't say at that point I was having, because this is COVID, I was dealing a lot with kids that have been sexually violated so as long as I went to my bed, I was dreaming when someone is either raping me or trying to kill me. Hmm. And partly it was because of what the media was telling us, but also for me who was on the ground, it was the reality of taking on different stories and different strains of... Um, anyway, so I have this dream and I'm terrified and I'm crying. It wasn't a dream. I feel like it was an out of body experience because as much as I know, I was fully awake. But I was just like under a wave, uh, a cloud where I could not rise up or do anything. And some of it seems like a spiritual thing. But anyways, so I, I leave the bedroom and walk into the lounge. And I get this phone 
and I start uh, um, I start reading Psalm the Psalm ninety one, and there is there like a two hour prayer out of the Psalm, and then I figured quickly that I needed more help. So as I'm crying, I write to my psychologist. I say, <laughs> this, this is what has happened, you know, like, and then um, and then as soon as I get through the email, guess what? Power goes off. <laughs> And I'm like, okay. I'm doomed. I am. And this is like a very small resort in Mokono. And then I'm like, I like have a sense of it. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I was their own guest that week. The only guest that week. Um, people had been there during the day, but in the night I was the only like resident guest. And in the morning, when I woke up again, I'm used to smiling and stuff. I woke up and as if nothing had happened. And I said to them, I have to go. But at least... One thing I was thankful for, so my psychologist writes back and says, I think it's good for you to go and have yourself checked. Maybe you're sick. And so I went to, so I left in the morning, went to hospital, and then they did all these tests, which came out to be um, negative. And so then she, then he said, oh, maybe we could consider something else is going on. Tell me about your wife. But then in the evening, the, the, the psychologist said, as soon as you get back from hospital, let me know, and then we'll have a call. And we had a conversation, which she established. I think some some people had shared with the experience already had already diagnosed me, and then she came back and said, "I think what I'm hearing is that you need to sleep, you need to eat, and you need to cry." Um, and so I think vividly that's when I was first with mental health because I think if that wasn't handled, maybe I would be in, in a mental institution now. Because you had you you have mentioned that. You're having a psychologist already. When do you get to build this relationship? Because it feels like you're already having some kind of consultations with them. Yes. So um, when I went to study in the UK, I went to study theology and uh, apologetics. Mm -hmm. And we had like a resident psychologist at the school. And so I never broke the relationship with them. And so then, because I was moving into work that needs a lot of support. So for 10 years, she has talked to me freely. Mm -hmm. So we just shared you either every month, depending on the intensity of the emotions going on. Um, but in um, that time, she offered to talk to me every time I needed it. So even if it was every day, she was available. But it, it felt like we needed two twice a week, and then we went to once a week, and then went back to the usual. Uh, and I thought that she was spot on by saying, you know, this is why. Because as soon as I started eating more, I, quickly I was put on food supplements, hence the conversation earlier. Yeah. And um, and so from almost eating nothing to, you know, becoming a foodie. And then um, and then I had cried. So she said to me, can you watch a movie that can make you cry? <laughs> <laughs> and then you had to look for them. <laughs> I'm like, even when I watch something painful, I know how to make sure I don't. So, so this is the thing. When I feel like something is really heavy, I laugh. And, and my body resets itself. You know? So, so yeah. I'll say the most complex thing and I'll laugh about it and I, and I go. But also I think by principle, I don't share about something unless I've worked myself through it. And usually I do that by writing a poem. So once I've written about something, she usually eats. I feel like I've conquered it. I actually so, wanted to ask you when you were talking about some night where you felt like you couldn't sleep until mm. you started writing some poems. I, I wanted to ask you if that's your way of coping with life. Yes, yes. I, I, think, I think for me, poems are a very good way for me to express. I always tell people, when you're listening to me, maybe you're not getting the truth until you read what I'm reading. That's the only way you can capture really where my heart is. And some people have one minute to do that, like, don't expose yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I, I love, and I, I've written ever since I was young about every so many things, beauty, what. But in the past, maybe three, four years, I've written a lot about sex violence, and I think because it's part of my reality, talking with people who are dealing with that. Um, yeah, and then the other things like walking, I love taking very long walks, and partly because they lead me to a very big place of exhaustion. And once my body's fully exhausted, then I can tap into uh, the real issue. And then I love cinema, you know. Um, you know, when it's so hard, life becomes smoother when I go to the cinema. Yes. <laughs> but when, when my husband and I were dating, he also had something that I really fancied at that time. They're like reflective cards. So again, they, you, you, they will have conversations on what you want to eat to 
what is a predominant emotion. And so they have like promptings from simple basic things to really massive uh, things. And so I appreciated that, but I think he outgrew it after a year of doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that would do like on, an, on a weekly basis, we'll have a day where we just kind of like try to uh, talk through that. I wish I could do it more often. Uh, but it's said that men tend to not want to talk a lot. So I think he's outgrown it. Um, yeah. So, uh, some guests don't want to talk. Yeah, I think, I think he's outgrown it. But that was a very good, helpful resource. And again, like even when I met him, I was like, hey, you know, like talking about those things. And he wasn't judgmental about the whole thing. He seems to know what we needed at that time. And um, so, so I've been thankful for that. Um, but yeah, writing is is one. Yeah. And it helps with your anxiety as well. How have you been managing? I think I think the psychologist has done a great job because I feel like sometimes with anxiety or depression, you just need a language of what's going on. And I think also the other unique thing that my psychologist has never done, she has never given me a terminology. So all I know is that I have trouble with emotions. And I can Google and know, like Google. <laughs> you know, I've had Google can attacks. give anyone cancer, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, like when I've had like panic attacks, insomnia, so I can look at those and I'm like, okay, this is the way it's feeling. Like it looks like that, but from her, I've never had any term, right? Uh, but the, you know, you you walk through it and you know where either when you're having suicide ideation or when you having those panic attacks, and sometimes I, I would have those and then like become so good at it that almost no one. Everyone would ignore it. I'm like, I'm dying here. How come you guys don't see that I'm dying? Or um, um, so, so, so. Like I said, conversation with her has, and and I think partly because she's given me always language on how to think through whatever is happening. And sometimes that would mean validation, or to say, "Are you angry?" And one would be angry at that, or it seems like you're not sleeping, and those seem very basic. Um, so I think. She's helped me that way, but also being vocal about where I'm, I am. So um, I know, again, like when I'm, I'm writing, you know, I'd rather die than live. That sounds outrageous, but I would rather people understand that actually here it is. And every time I've put, uh, in fact, the, you know, again, like I said, I've written a lot about sex violence. The times I've written stuff and the things I don't want even people to read. You know? mm. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll share it with someone like, you know me. How did you know that this is what I was thinking? Well, you've given me language to everything that I was going on. And so, yes, yeah, so writing is a big tool for me and verbalizing what is going on. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you as a Christian, tell us about how important it is for us to have these conversations, mental health conversations in um, believer spaces. Yeah, I, I, I think it is important because we live in a fallen world. At least the Bible teaches that. And rather than what we want to believe, there's so many people who are struggling with mental health issues. I mean, think of great prophets like Elijah who has slain uh, prophets of Baal. And the next thing is he's falling apart. And the Lord sends him something about to give him food and challenge him to sleep, Right. Um, the Psalms, you know, we've just talked about that. I read most of the Psalms and I'm like, okay, whatever you're going on is really bad. I think this is bad. What you're dealing with is really bad. So so I think it's it's important for the church to help people understand we live in a fallen world. Mm-hmm. And a fallen world means bad things are happening. And we don't help people by asking them to deny. It's until we face to face with whatever is going on that we can search for help. And so there's so many people who are going for, cans- uh, for for prayer or counseling from pastors who would actually need maybe some medication to help them sleep better, right? And so it's important for us to understand that this God, if he also came in human flesh to reach out to us, we need to help people embrace their humanity. Mm-hmm. And part of humanity means that we are broken, we are fallen. Um, and it gets better when you talk about it. I'm not where I was you know, three years ago, today, today I could have some issues, but it's not as bad. It's maybe fatigue, but not anything like that. I'm not hallucinating. I'm not spending days awake, but partly because I've had a chance to be listened to. Yeah. And actually, my psychologist is a is a Christian, and and is a Christian, and and I remember when she helped me go through that particular season. I wrote to her and I said to her, "If God was a female, a, 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 a female, I imagine her to be like you." 
because I think, and, 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 you know, it was best because I was like, thank you for telling me that what I needed was to cry and sleep and eat more. Did you cry though? I don't know. No, <laughs> not that year. I've had another day of crying, but it wasn't that year, I think. Um, but, is it better now? It is better. Um, I think I'm at a place where when you get married, somehow you learn to cry. <laughs> is it? <laughs> Yeah. Uh-uh. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think you get people who will, you know, sometimes your husband will get on your nerves. Please don't put that in. <laughs> We're human beings. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like, yeah, I think, yeah, part of the beauty of marriage has given me a chance to be more expressive emotionally um, than I was when I was alone. I think because also it comes with security. So I don't, I'm not saying that because I think my husband is a bad person. I think that if he saw me cry, he's not thinking, oh, you're so pathetic. I think he'll come along to say, oh, great. And to be fair, I don't think any, you know, I have the best siblings in the world. I think my mom is the most tender person. I think for me, I never cried before my mom because I felt like she would feel more broken. You know, so I think she would cry more. Um, And so there was always a sense in which I'll protect you. Yeah. And I won't let you see me this way. Oh, my goodness. So, but I feel like, for for my husband, then it, it's okay for him to see because I feel like he can handle it. You know, he can handle it a little. Oh too my much. goodness! And so, now, yeah. when you know, when you put that out like that, I wonder how many children have grown up, or maybe I, maybe let's speak about the girls specifically. I wonder how many they are mm-hmm. that have grown with a single mother, and they mm-hmm. feel like. I don't want to show my mother that I'm cracking because they might get more broken. Mm-hmm. I've been carrying that mm-hmm. from the time I was a kid. And none that she said, don't express yourself. She was always there. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, I knew what she was going through. Yeah, yeah. And, and yet I just didn't want yeah. to invite so, her so, in so, my so emotions. One, one my sister and I have said, like, ne mama ngata guma. because for her, and myself, we decided that we're going to be strong women. And strong women <laughs> said we're not going to express how we feel. My sister mm. is better at expression. I was like a rock. And I think people see it as a surprise because I think I'm also compassionate. And maybe that's why I deal with some of the things. I'm very empathetic. But even in my empathy, you know, if I came to see you when you're sick, don't expect me to be crying with you. I'll be like giving you all the good stories for you to, to find something to laugh about. Can I tell but you something? I'll help you, right? I, Can I, will, yeah. I want to tell you something terrible. There is someone, when you, when you mentioned the part of empathy and then the sick person, I think sometimes we are short of words to mm-hmm. express empathy. Mm-hmm. My aunt, before she passed, she told us about someone that she does not want to see. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> because when she was okay, I think they would go together to visit sick people. Yeah. And then this chick would be like, don't worry, you're going to die. (laughs) I did not worry, Costa, you're going to die. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. This this conversation is great. And uh, I feel like maybe we have come to the end of it. Yeah. But before we close, do you feel like there is something that you may have left behind? That you might have left out? No, I don't know. I feel like I could say a lot of things. <laughs> uh, I feel like I could say a lot of things, especially pertaining uh, mental health. Mm-hmm. But I think that for me, you know, I was at a prayer meeting and I shared my story like I've done. And, you know, it takes on if, uh, you know, I'll share with you some of the stuff I've written. And so I'm like... If you're trying to be a girl, people need to hear what the Lord has done. My goodness. And if there is a legacy I want to be attached to me is that I was real. You know, for me, there's no sugar quoting. What you see is what you get. If you get me and I'm tired, then it's tired. When you get me, um, I'm having a good day, it's a good day. And I think it's important for us to um, allow people to because again this person is saying or oh, this because you're a Christian I read I read scripture and I see broken people I mean Jesus breaks down and he says in the good testament yes and he says if it's possible take away this cup of suffering from me right and so if our God can step down and feel the suffering how much more 
for me who is not divine? You know, can I feel it? And I think that we need to, in whatever ways it looks like, to step in and validate people's feelings. This is the last story I'll tell you. The biggest loss I've suffered is when my cousin died, Flavia, and I've written extensively about her experience, my experience Mm -hmm. dealing with her death. And I'm a very high depression functioning person. So when something is wrong, I am most effective. And so through hospital, I was trying to get money to keep her alive. I was trying to, and when she died, I was organizing the funeral and making sure everything is set. And so I was starting university, a, a postgrad program the following day after her funeral. And indeed, I left the village and came back. And my mom had raised her in our house. And so everyone knew my mom had lost a child, but no one knew that I'd lost somebody. And so for three weeks, no one said something about, you know, her death. You know, you know how people call you. But they came and buried. But once we buried, then they were over. And until today, I thought she was the most perfect human being that ever created. We were both almost the same size. She was shorter. So we were twinning almost all my clothes. She had a copy of my clothes. And she was sweet. I mean, think about sweetness mm-hmm. in someone. Very beautiful, very kind, very intelligent. And so she dies. And my mom returned three weeks later. And he's like, no, I was like, no one came. And until she said it, but this is what had, was happening every day. I hate cooking. Ever since I got married, I've cooked once. That's in 19 months. <laughs> but every day I was cooking. Because I thought someone should come and wanaja asanga we mere. And I would give that food to the children because I'm anti Rachel for every child in Kalere. So we were janga kuliang anji gaba. But it it wasn't registering that I was doing it and you know, but my life was going on. And so until she comes out and like Rachel knows I'm kwana joba bad one, and I'm like, Mikwano Jange? No one. And when she mentioned that, I just fell into like a depression. I remember one night I was I wrote that extensively. And my friend who is American wrote back and like, Richard, you're not grieving properly. This doesn't sound right. Another gentleman who is a pastor read it. I was like, we want to talk to you tomorrow. Would you want to come? And so they, they invited me and we talked for six hours. They don't believe it was six hours, but it was six hours. We talked from midday to 6 p.m. And these are the questions they asked me. Why did she die? But until they asked me, I was asking myself almost every second, why did she die? And I would tell myself the story. And like, is there anything you would have done? And then I would respond in my head every day, every day. Uh, I had listened to, the last song we listened to was when Brian Vegas had released Inyanjala. And we both loved it. And I'd played that song countless times. You know, like when you put it on repeat the whole Mm -hmm. day for three weeks. And that thing had started traumatizing me. It gave me hope, but also traumatized me equally. And all through, I dealt with that until she says, and so this gentleman talked to me. And then they, they asked me who was in charge of the funeral. And they're like, we didn't have to ask you. We knew all this. But she, uh, the gentleman is called Dr. Philip. He's the, he's the principal cast, Kampala School, Evangelical School of Theology, and Pastor Emmanuel, who is the dean. Then he said to me, he said, people don't understand in Africa, in the West, that's your cousin. No, you have a and then you like, because everyone feels, if you say, I lost my cousin, it doesn't hit home. But actually, if it was your little sister, and for me, it was my little sister. And so those men said to me, what he experienced was terrible. Mm. And that set me, gave me permission to grieve better. And other things. So they said, they said, Rachel, you know, we didn't have to ask you who was in charge of everything. I was in charge of everything. I'm not exaggerating. I was in charge of everything. I did all that perfectly with a beautiful smile. And then finally, uh, he said, you have to be young. Allow yourself to break down. If you wake up in the morning and you want to close the door, the whole day, do it. But I had 8,000. Um, I had 8,000 in my bank. And I saw this guy in Atunda secondhand shoes. And I bought myself a second-hand pair of shoes. Now, that's a big deal. <laughs> I bought, you know, those flip-flops, and I put them on. And, it, and as soon as I walked along, Auntie Rachel, what is that? So I think for me, the thing I learned from that is validating what has happened. 
and also giving yourself permission to grieve, giving yourself, you know, if, if it's crying for you to, if for me it's writing, write whatever nonsense that there is, are things I've written, I'm like, what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> Those things and then also like allowing to spoil yourself because I think many of the people who struggle are like, you're trying to help everyone keep going. And, you don't and so the yourself. question is, who is taking care of you? And if no one is there, then you should be the one who is taking it, you know, standing in the gap for yourself and yeah. doing it for yourself. So if it's getting a phone, before you solve all the problems, for me, if, if I pay all the tuition, do I have a phone? And those are things that we miss out. But if you don't take care of you, you know, my friend says, God has given you the horse and the horse to be an evangelist. God and has? Given you a horse, you know, like to help you carry the message. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't take care of the horse, then you can't take the message. And so I need to take care of the horse and the horse is me. And so I need to sleep. I need to eat better. I need to work out. I need to exercise. I need to find people to talk to. I need to love myself enough to buy flowers even when someone has not brought the flowers. Mm. Um, Yeah, I'll stop there. It's, (laughs) it's, it's, It's very much more like a summary of if empathy doesn't include you, it's not empathy. That's right. Is there another word that you would want to leave the listener? Something that you would want them to walk away with? Something to keep them going? I think for anyone struggling, it gets better. It does. In mm. the valley, it does not. But there, you know, this this may sound a little fishy, but I, uh, ever since I was maybe 12, I listened to a guy called Wintley Phipps. And he said these words that have been like a wallmark in my life. And he said, it's in the quiet crucible of our private personal suffering. Our greatest gifts are given and our, our noblest dreams are born and always born or given for what we have been through. In the crucible of our private personal, I think for me those are the words, mm-hmm. our greatest gifts are given and our noblest dreams are born. And I think for me, I learned empathy in the crucible. And I think some people have been saved because I had a crucible. And so don't look at your crucible of suffering and thinking, oh, I'm going to be finished here. No, it gets better. And if you do the right things, if you seek help, um, yes, you will find it. And so that's my encouragement. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. (laughs) Do you want to really look at the emotional will and tell us how you're feeling? Mm. Tell us how you feel. Okay. Okay. There's so many. (laughs) <laughs> um, I think we've had a good conversation. I, uh, I, I've loved I, it. I, yeah, I feel I feel listened to as well. I, I feel honoured. Um, um, I yeah, it's a blessing to be here. And uh, probably in the next thirty minutes, I'll be. You know, I am also that kind of person. I don't reflect things in the moment. I kind of like go and chew on and stuff. So. I can give you after the conversation on said. So probably at midnight, I'll be like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I think this is, but usually in the moment, yeah. uh, I am okay. But I think I'm thankful that I'm able to be here. Thank you so much for showing up. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for hanging out with us to the very end. If you loved the episode, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Castbox, Podbean, or any other podcast platform of your choice. It is by the power of our community that we shall make this podcast grow. Also, feel free to share your insights about what connected with you on social media or also comment on YouTube. For social media, you can tag us, right? YouTube, you just have to put in the comment section. Social media, be sure to tag us. We are at hashtag we now goes to on Facebook and Instagram and on X. Our under is at HTNK Podcast. Or you can use the hashtag HTNK Insation. See you next week.